meeting here with uh, my, my good friend Baruch. Welcome Baruch to the webinar and really pleased to uh, see all of you again. And we are um, praying and talking about these critical times here Baruch and um, this uh, Straight Kingdom Talk a webinar here to bring everyone up to speak is about uh, the critical time we are living in. And we will be having um, our friend Gary join shortly if he can get past technical difficulties. Um, but really, pleased to have you with us, Baruch. How are Shalom. you today? Shalom from Israel. I'm doing well. It's my pleasure to be with you. And we are living at some, I don't know if it's critical times, it's interesting times, times that we need to be to be seeking God and his guidance, his leadership, and relying more upon the communication of the Holy Spirit rather than simply what we hear on the media, because there's a lot of confusing information and things that they're doing. I don't recall when there's been flus in the past that everyone is supposed to get tested. So yeah. I think that there's a lot that's going on that's not uh, based upon legitimacy, and we need to wake up as a people and stand and be bold and testify oh, yeah. that, that our God comes first and that we're going to follow the leadership of Scripture and not necessarily what, what the so-called leaders want us to do. So true. And I know that... Um we are praying without ceasing, but um, as we enter this conversation, I just want to, I would like to uh, lead us here in prayer. As all, all of you who are listening on, really pleased to have you with us, and we'll be praying. And if you can join us here in prayer, so God can align our hearts and minds to, to be his heart and mind. And here we have... Uh, Dr. Gary Hill with us, who joined us. Hey, Gary. Um, can you hear us okay? Well, while he's working on his microphone, I'll be saying, Father God, thank you so much for this time. Uh, late at night for Baruch and early morning for me and for Gary. Uh, in his afternoon. I pray, Lord God, for everyone who's joined this webinar, that this will be not just another webinar where, where we're chit-chatting, but God, we pray that you give us the words to speak your truths in love, to encourage and edify your body, the body of Messiah, the body of Christ, all over the world. Lord, that we can mobilize an army to, to do your work in your kingdom at such a time as this, Lord, where your people need to rise up and fight the good fight to be faithful soldiers of our Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you, Lord, that you are enabling us. Thank you, Lord, that you are sending faithful servants like Baruch and Giri, um to edify the body of Christ, Lord. And I pray that as we talk, that you will speak your word, that everyone listening on will um, will be able to follow up on this webinar and be your witnesses in this generation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. How are you getting going on there, Gary? Is everything, are you able to hear us? My recommendation, Semo, is let's begin. We'll go forward, and if Gary's picture comes up, a live picture, and he's communicating, right. we definitely want to join, have him join with us. But until that gets straightened out, let's move forward. Well, we're moving forward in power, Baruch. Um, what's the word that you have for all of us uh, during this uh, time? I know that I said critical times because there are a lot of people in lockdown. Oh, they're Baruch. Not able Oh, there you go. Hey, Gary. Welcome. Um, are you still hearing us? We're not able to see you. 
Okay, maybe we'll say hello again. But um, during this time, what work do you have for those who are locked down and who are um, struggling to uh, meet with another, being able to fellowship? Um, what work do you have for those who are not able to, uh, you know, meet as a church? Well, let, let's take a step back. I think the word that comes into my mind is delusion. I think a lot of what's happening now, when this came out, I thought that it would be prudent for us to uh, evaluate things, to give governments and, and the so-called experts, to give them the benefit of the doubt and such. But I think we've been lied to. I think that there is a lot of deceit that's going on. And we need to, to wake up. And we don't see the, the pandemic that the media is portraying all over the world. So we need to be individuals that uh, say enough is enough and, and well, move forward with our life. Well, I, I okay, Gary's with us. All right, Gary, um, are you with us? Are you trying to talk? Okay, go ahead, Burke. Oh, oh, he's trying to. I, I, I strongly believe that we are being, uh, there's an attempt to mislead people. There's a lot of information that people are trying to get. For example, how many people died last year in the month of April in various states and in, in different countries and such? That's very hard to get that information now compared to this year. And to get what's happened in February in deaths, there's an individual, I saw him on the BBC, and he's trying, he's a professor, he's trying to get information such as this, and it's very difficult. Why? Why can't we get this information to compare? Is this year really different than, than last year or the year before that? And my suspicion is that we're going to be very surprised that we've been sold things that are not accurate, that that hundreds of thousands of people have died well is that an increase compared to this time last year or is it not this is the information we need and i don't see evidence here in israel i don't see evidence that that what's going on now is really different than what's going on in many other years previously so we need to to wake up and we need to to move forward and carry on with our lives and not believe this, in my opinion, there's enough evidence to suspect that we have been deceived. Okay. So um, as to the um, delusion or deception that you're referring to, Baruch, um, praying for discernment, what do we need to discern during this time? In what way have we been deceived? Is it the numbers of deaths? Is it the um, the exaggeration of the scenario? Um, what exactly do you see? Well, as I said earlier, I, I don't remember years where they had a test. They got this up running so quick that everyone has to be tested. That's that's what we hear on the media, how important testing is. Well, I know that in some countries we travel a lot. And if you look at Russia, for example, they're doing testing primarily in Moscow, in large cities. In other cities, you don't see them doing thousands of tests each day and such. People are going on with their lives. It's interesting the countries, you mentioned lockdown, the countries that are, are highly locked down and such, are we seeing better numbers? I think the last time we, we spoke, Colombia. Colombia has been locked down for, for six months. Their numbers were a few weeks ago, they're worse. So I don't see a All correlation right. between this lockdown and improvements. So mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think it's the, the way that uh, we ought to go. I don't see the, the benefits of that. Wow. Gary, do we have you with us? Um, are you able to hear us? A talk. I don't think he can hear us. So let's let's move forward. All right. Um, so with this 
um, so-called lockdown that's not accomplishing much, if I correctly, um, because it's based on a premise that um, this is really serious and a lot of people are dying, which um, if you look at the evidence further is uh, highly contested. Um, very debatable and arguable and people can argue about it all day long I guess but what really matters at this time is how do we respond as the people of God how would you see the, uh, the church responding that has been divided and conquered by um, you know the, um, the enemy so to speak the God of this world we, we, we defeat the enemy by being faithful to God. We don't allow the enemy to take us away from the things that God has called us to do. And this is what's happening in, in much of the believing community. And that is that this virus is causing our behavior to be very different as the body of believers, rather than going forward, doing the things that we're supposed to do, having our prayer meetings, having times of interceding for one another, laying on of hands, having group discussions over the word of God, teachings going forth. And we are simply allowing people go out and do other things together. We see that, that businesses in most parts in Israel, businesses are meeting, companies are going back to work. In Israel, they had restrictions for a while. And here's the key. We don't see businesses having outbreaks, factories having outbreaks of, of great numbers and such. So I, I think there's a lot of, of misinformation being provided. Yeah. So what are practical uh, things that um, we ought to do as the government tells us, hey, we can't meet it's too risky, um, you know, just hold off on church. I know that in the United States, um, so several, many churches have said, we are probably not going to be able to meet till next year. And um, people are just waiting, uh, watching the news, uh, letting the media tell us what's going on. Um, and But there's God's truth, there is reality. And... God has called us to do the work of an evangelist, to uh, herald his good news, to, to preach the gospel to the poor, to the brokenhearted, um, to be his witnesses in this world. How can we be his witnesses? What are practical ways that we can get around these government restrictions? Well, here again, they are not government restrictions. There's usually one individual. And I don't believe if you're talking about the United States, you're in Australia, I don't know what the laws are there and how it works. I'm in Israel, it's different than America. But if we look at America, I'm not so sure legally that the governor or a mayor has the right to impose these things. What we're seeing is people accepting that authority that the, the leadership one individual usually has taken, and they have no legal right to do that. What I've done some research, and in a state of an emergency, it may be true, but those states of emergencies, those times are severely limited to sometimes 72 hours, less than a week. That gives time for the legislator to move and make law but but what we find today is that there's been no laws enacted there is simply one individual who makes the determine in many states what's going to be done and what's not going to be done now let's just put this aside let's talk about something that uh, is relevant to this a pastor in california has been got has received a lot of attention because they have determined to to meet i think that's good what I disagree with is this, going to court for the court to give you permission to meet. I don't think that's scriptural. I think it's scriptural simply to meet. And let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Let's go back to the book of Daniel. Should we not base our, our decisions upon scripture? 
And Daniel, he lived at a time when there was a, a government and they deemed it improper by punishment of death for you to pray to any other God than the one that, that the government said. Did, did Daniel go to court? Did he say, we need to lobby? We need to raise money to oppose this? No. He simply did as he knew was right. He went home and he prayed three times a day. And he allowed the, the consequences to be up to God. And God proved himself faithful. In that same way, why use God's money for, for court procedure, proceedings? Just meet. Why, why, why put ourselves under an authority that does not have any right to say whether we can assemble? Right. There's no justification for that. So I'm very opposed to, to going to court to get permission. I think we simply need to, to meet. And where we were when we talked about this maybe a month ago was, was limiting the numbers of people. I, I don't even think that that's required now. We see too many places where people have met and there's not this outbreak, there's not this uh, uh, mass uh, infusion of, of sick people. And the problem is, and I'll, I'll stop with this, but so many of the people that have this virus, and, and I don't doubt that there's a virus, but over 80% of them have no symptoms. There's, there's no side effects. And we're so con concerned that they're going to affect, but there's very few people that have these side effects. And I think we all saw that the CDC in America said that the percent of people that die from it, that, that do not have any pre-existing conditions, any secondary health problems, are very low, around 6%. And if you compare that with the, the flu, and these are people they're, they're taking into account, many of them of that 6% are very old, elderly. And in Israel, they used to, to share the, the people who died, their name and their age. They stopped doing that. But what we found when they were doing it is that there were people in their 90s, in their 80s, in their late 70s, and that's who was dying. The number of people that are even in their 60s and below are very, very small. The last I saw in America, when it was about 160,000 people dead in America with the so-called died from coronavirus, what we know is about 53 were under the age of 18, and all but two had extraordinary circumstances, health problems. So we want to shut down the economy. And I believe that in a typical year, the flu takes lives, disease takes lives. But this reaction and what the governments are doing has much more to do with, in my opinion, a political agenda, a political agenda that's rooted in the enemy's desires, not the desires of God. And the church is just, just turning over to that. And one of the reasons for that is fear. We ought not be afraid of this. Well, there are many places in Scripture where it says, do not fear. And it's a command. It's not an option to disobey. So um, a lot of irrational things happen when we fear. And we do things that we get surprised by. Um, not long ago here in Australia, where I'm at, um, people will be racking up toilet rolls because they're thinking they're going to run out of toilet rolls and people will be standing in panic that they will be running out of supplies because of import and export etc and it just goes to show how something like this um, can really throw people off <laughs> and um, I've been recently in Jeremiah um, during his time the government was not faithfully acting on behalf of the people. Um, and let, the me just correct, let me just correct something. Yeah. The government is supposed to act in behalf of God if it's a, a God-appointed government according to his standards. That's right. And when we don't have a government like that, 
It's the body of believers that need to act, behave, Amen. execute justice. We're supposed to be the salt of the earth, the light of the world. We're yes. called to fill in that vacuum instead of panicking and with treating back and believing that, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. There was a, a husband and wife and they were separated because of the coronavirus. They couldn't travel between these two countries. And what did they do? They, they Zoomed like we're doing right now in, in virtual meetings. Now, they said that when they were finally able to come back together, those virtual meetings did not meet the same, same feelings, the same outcome as when they were together personally. And it is wrong, it is incorrect to believe that a congregation that, that Zooms and everything's online and such, that that meets the same requirement as gathering together. It does not. It's foolish to think that a, a marriage, a married couple will find the same satisfaction through Zoom as they do from, from being together physically. So the body of believers, we need to come together in order to worship God. Can we worship God by ourselves? Obviously we can, but corporate worship is commanded in the scripture. Amen. Oh my. Um, it's so easy, isn't it, Berg, to compromise? Um, and say, well, the government has told us not to meet. The, the government has said it's dangerous. And just saying, well, the government trumps, so to speak, the uh, word of God, what we, the commands of scripture. And we know in scripture, like uh, you, Daniel, <laughs> when the government required Daniel and the boys to bow down and not obey the commands of the Lord, they did not say, okay, well, God, you have ordained the, command, uh, the government to contradict you, so they were, we're not going to pay attention to your word. Um, but, you know, a lot of people make uh, rationalizations in their mind, saying, well, we can, after all, meet. Um, it's just not in person. Um, we are meeting virtually, and we are talking to one another over the uh, we're still praying together, we're still doing all those things, and that's my conscience. Um, what do you say to those who um, are troubled in their conscience to, um, they believe that the virus is dangerous and they may have had some loved ones who fell sick and nearly died, um, <clears throat> or they have hurt maybe. Um, what do you say to those who are kind of troubled and saying, well, Baruch, it is dangerous, I'm not, um, Maybe we're underestimating this. Uh, what do you say to those who are troubled? Well, I'm certainly not saying that there's no virus. There is a virus. People have died from that virus. I think the numbers are, are highly skeptical of the, of the large numbers that we're seeing, but put that aside. We know a woman from, from Texas. She was, I believe, 78. She had some circumstances as well. But she died of coronavirus, and her family grieves over that. So we're not trying to be insensitive. We're not denying right. this. But we need to have a right perspective. People die every year from the flu. That doesn't make us happy, but we don't uh, withdraw in panic. Let, let me point something out. You were talking about rationalizing things and using the Bible. What, what I hear a lot of people say to me is this. They say quarantine is biblical. We see in the Bible that, that God has quarantine. Yes and no. This is a great example of people twisting scripture rather than understanding what it says. The quarantine that they were referring to was when someone has leprosy. And who quarantined? Did the whole community quarantine? No, the one who was infected, the one who had leprosy. They went and excluded themselves. But the rest of society went on. So in this same way, those who have fear, those who are sick, it's appropriate for them, just like anytime someone is sick, they should stay at home and not infect others. But if someone is not sick, they don't have any symptoms, they're doing well, we, we get out, we move forward. We don't want to simply see everything we don't want to see the body of believers cease. We don't want businesses to stop. We don't want to create, and this is where 
I might like to take this this uh, uh, discussion a little bit. If you ask terrorists, what is their number one objective? A terrorist will tell you when you look at their websites and see experts that examine the number one purpose of terrorism is financial. Not even fear, not death, but financial reper repercussions, repercussions to the, the terrorist act. And what we're seeing today is that the coronavirus is bringing serious financial uh, outcomes to individuals. And what that's going to bring about is a lot of instability. And that's where the enemy thrives in instability. And the problem is too many of the believers are, are panicking rather than realizing that we have a sure foundation. And that is our Lord. He's called the foundation of our faith. And we need to act in a way that demonstrates our, our belief that our life is founded upon him and not the instability. Instability is going to come on this world. We need to be people that overcome. And if we're locked down, if we're retreating, if we're at home, if we're doing all of that, we're not providing a godly testimony. We're not being salt of the earth. And we, we, are, not, we are not showing that we're more than conquerors in Messiah. Wow. Amen. We are not going to be terrorized by the enemy. In fact, I, was, um, I know that our brother Moses, who was with the Lord, um, Moses, who uh, led the Israelites out of Egypt into the Promised Land, as he was uh, for 40 years in the wilderness with them, he would try to reason with them. He would say, hey, you have seen the hand of the Lord his mighty works, he is taking you out of Egypt, uh, you know, with uh, the great miracles that have happened. Um, and yet, people will be uncertain, they will be contradicting Moses all through those 40 years. And um, in the beginning, um, when they sent God spies into the land um, to see how good the land was, they brought report, and the majority of the report was, hey, the land is great, but the enemies are stronger than us. They are powerful and they are big and strong. And the people got dismayed. They got into fear. And that fear led them into rebellion against the word of the Lord spoken through Moses. And this is what's happening in our generation if we are not careful. And I've, unfortunately, I have to say it has already happened where people are following the voice of the enemy, the voice of uh, those who are saying, this is really bad. And the servants of the Lord, like you, Baruch, are urging us, like Moses, um, as it says in Deuteronomy 1, verse 29. Um, Do not be shocked, nor fear them. And the word for shocked is to become terror-stricken, where we want to intimidate it by, by a force which is ruthless and tyrannical, by these so-called terrorists, um, uh, so to speak, who are going for financial gain, and nor fear them. This is a command. <laughs> this is not an option. So if we are afraid and we are not able to think straight, we need to come back to the Word of God as you urge us. And we have this throughout the Bible. We have this in Daniel's time, like you mentioned, Moses' time, Jeremiah's time. Uh, the, the whole Old Testament and New Testament is full of that. So um, how do we respond when we are afraid, Baruch, um, when we feel off? Well, if we're feeling afraid, we need to acknowledge our disobedience, that we are paying attention to the enemy rather than to God. I'll, I'll say two things related to that. First of all, we, we need to remember that, that quarantining biblically, as I said, was for leprosy for the one who was infected. In times of pestilence, the people see that biblically pestilence 
is as a judgment. So there was no place that we could hide. If this is God's judgment, and I've heard many people from, from across the theological spectrum that see this as a judgment from God, whether that is or not, each person that's listening, they can make their own decision. But let's look at some cases. Remember when there was a, a pestilence that God's, God's judgment was falling? And what did uh, Aaron do? He, he ran in with the censor. He didn't run away. He didn't retreat. But he ran into the, the pestilence of the Lord, the judgment. So he did not demonstrate fear, but he went forward. And I think that's an important message for us. We don't retreat. We go forward. Our call is an upward call, not a backward call. So the children of Israel were called to go forward into the, the, the nation of Israel, the land of promise. They wanted to go back. And I see great correlation between this lockdown, this staying at home, this all of this that's happened in different countries at different times and such. Israel, some, some cities are going to be locked down next week. At least that's what they're, they're announcing right now because of the increase. And we're not supposed to move back. We're supposed to be out there. And, and if, we, if we get the pestilence, it's rare. If we get that disease and we die, that's okay. I don't fear death. What we should fear is faithlessness, not being a godly witness, and not allowing disease to, to cause us to retreat and panic. Rather, we need to realize that, that what about the, the doctors? They're out on the, and the nurses and such, and the people. My son works at a grocery store. He works every day, every day but Shabbat. He's there. They're having to do that. And here's something interesting. He works at a very popular grocery store. Hundreds of people come in that grocery store each, each few hours. They have many, many workers. How many people, there's all this meeting going on, people there, probably 40, 50 workers at a time. How many cases of Corona has, has been recorded at that grocery store? The answer is zero, none. Now, you would think if it's so contagious that, that there would be this, this, you know, someone would get it. I mean, hundreds of people, hundreds of workers, but not one person has it. It's odd to me. It just doesn't add up to what we're hearing about how contagious the disease is. Oh, yeah, my. Um, I'm reminded, I know that Jeremiah came up earlier. Um, and as Jeremiah is working through his own troubles with um, the faithlessness of the people that he was ministering to, um, he um, was praying in Jeremiah chapter 12. Um, for those who want to turn, Jeremiah chapter 12, Righteous are you, O, o Lord, that I will plead my case with you. Indeed, I will discuss matters of judgment with you. Why have the way of the wicked prospered? Why are all those who deal in treachery at ease? You have planted them. You have planted them. They have also taken root. They grow. They have even produced fruit. You are near to their lips, but far from their mind, far from their heart, or their, uh, their emotional sensibilities, rather. You have known me, O Lord. You see me, and you examine my heart, heart toward you. Drag them off like sheep for the slaughter, and set them apart for the day of carnage. How long is the land to mourn, and the vegetation of the countryside to wither? For the wickedness of those who dwell in it, animals and birds have been snatched away because men have said he will not see our latter ending. And here is the key verse in verse 5. Now God is challenging Jeremiah as he is praying, as he is feeling the weight of this situation. If you have run with footmen and they have tired you out, and how can you compete with horses? If you fall down in a land of peace, how will you do in the thicket of the Jordan? Um, 
and it will go on about how the even the brothers, even family members will betray us um, or betray Jeremiah and the people of God. In other words, if times are easy, like for Jeremiah, it was going to get a lot worse. <laughs> but if, if we're already complaining during this time that things are really bad, Baruch, we are dying when a fraction of people are dying, like um, those who are over 60 are perhaps endangering that minimally. Um, and we don't want to minimize those who have lost loved ones. Um, we are acknowledging there is a virus, but things are going to get a lot worse. And God in his love and mercy has sent us something that's very bearable, um, where we can be a, a salt and light. While there is time, Baruch, should we not get out there and, and be courageous and bold and asking God, Lord, we want to be faithful to your word because more difficult and perilous times are coming, aren't they, Baruch? Much more difficult and perilous times are coming. That's exactly correct. You know, I, I would look at this and say, is the coronavirus all that unusual? I don't know. I'm not a scientist and such, but I wonder if it's really so unusual or is the response that the world has taken such lockstep? It's almost like planned out. If if it's not, if it's not manufactured to some degree. Now there's a disease, but the response. And I remember that uh, Governor Cuomo of New York, when this first started, and people were talking about lockdowns and stuff, he says, "You can't do that." You can't tell people they can't go to work. And he, what he was saying was very good, but he turned 180 degrees and embraced the, the memo of the, the powers of the world, so to speak. So I am very skeptical, not saying it's not, but I'm very skeptical that this coronavirus is such a strong, such a unique, such a, we're living in a very, very different time than ever before. I think it may be very likely that what's different about these times is how the governments have responded, how the media has have done very little fact checking, very little research. We see the same people on the news stations all the time. Why is that? Because they already know what they're going to say. They already know what they're going to say. And so I'm very skeptical that, that this is unique. I'm not one that, that is willing to say right now that this is a, a, a judgment that God has sent. I'm not so sure that this is not just a typical flu that has been misappropriated by the government for a purpose, for an agenda. And one thing that I look and see is that believers have not rushed forward. They have not stood up and, and said, we are our people that are going to be praying and we're going to assist and we're shut down everything. And when you have a, a pastor of one of the largest churches in the world, at least one of the largest churches in America, when, when he announces that he's going to shut down for the entire year. Now, how, you know, what if God, what if God brings about a miraculous he healing? God could do that. How do we know, and I think about the scripture uh, in Kings, remember when the people, the price of food was really expensive? For a donkey's head, it was astronomical what they wanted to sell uh, a donkey's head for. And the prophet said, this time tomorrow, the price of food is going to be normal. Oh, no one believed that it could be done, and it was. Why don't we believe that God could bring healing and, and rid, I don't know if he is or not, but he could. So why would we want to announce no more services for the rest of the year and do that back in July when there's six months left? We don't know what it is. You know what that is? That is an individual who wants to be man-pleasing, an individual that wants to show that they are submissive to the government because they're looking for honor of men rather than the honor of God. 
Oh my. The glory of God matters more, the glory matters far more, and it's the only thing that matters. And the wakiness of the Word of God, as you have said time and time again during this call, is far more important than the weight that people put on, you know, delusional. God is, His Word is truth. His Word is reality. And, I mean, you mentioned how we should not fear death, but rather faithlessness. When a son of man comes, will he find faith on the earth? It says in Luke 18. In fact, it says in Luke 18 that we ought to, as you were urging us, uh, pleading with us, uh, how we ought to pray and not lose heart. And in order to pray better, Baruch, uh, during this time, what do we ought to do so we are not just praying, saying, God, please take this coronavirus away, and it's going to be with us probably a long time. Um, what is a prayer that pleases God? Because there is such a thing as praying amiss. How should we pray in a way that pleases God during this time? And how do we not only pray, because we read in Jeremiah 12 that he is on our lips, but uh, far from our mind, our, our emotional sensibilities. How do we become more aware and, and catch the heart and mind of God during this time? So we pray in a way that is pleasing to Him rather than pay lip service. Well, the first thing I would say, let's talk about how not to pray. And how not to pray is, God, take this away immediately. Maybe God wants us to learn something from this. Maybe God has allowed this, caused this, whatever it may be. Who knows the mind of God? For whatever reason, we're in this situation, whether it's manufactured, whether it's worse, much worse than I believe it is. What is it that God wants me to learn from it? So just don't pray initially. Take this away, end this, put everything back to normal. I don't want to go back to normal. I want to grow. I want to mature. I want to be changed. I want to be transformed. So first, let's pray, God, what are you wanting to teach us in this situation? What can I learn? What changes do you want to bring about in my life in this situation? That's first. The, the second thing, you mentioned a couple times the book of Jeremiah. And the great problem, we know that the, the problem of of the people, the tribe of Judah, or the nation of Judah, was their idolatry. But idolatry was really just the, the, the manifestation of an inner problem. If you read carefully the book of Jeremiah, several times it speaks about a, a stubborn heart. And, and that's what I think we should really be, be asking ourselves. God, do I have a stubborn heart? Is, is, is this something that I'm responding to incorrectly and I'm set in my ways? I want what I want. I want to accomplish what I want to get out of it. Or, and that's what we see in the book of Jeremiah, it's that stubborn heart that produces faithlessness. So we need to see that, that this circumstance, we need to examine ourselves, our, our hearts, being mindful of the purposes of God. How does God want me to behave in the midst of this? How can I be a blessing to others? What, what opportunities is this creating? And I think all too often we have retreated into doing nothing and we allow the government to step in and help people because we have, we're done, we're closed up until next year. And I'm not saying that the congregations that aren't meeting aren't doing other things, but it's, it's, it's not the same. Amen. Similar is not same. <laughs> if it looks like something and it, it resembles, it talks about having a form of godliness, but having denied its power, there are lookalikes. And we want to be spared from looking like we are obeying when we are not actually obeying. And so um, bringing this to a um, closure here, Baruch, uh, rounding this up, you have um, 
brought up how important it is for us not to be deceived. Do not be deceived, brethren. Uh, it's, it says in scripture. And there is such a thing as deception. And only going to the word of God will keep our head clear uh, during these times. And um, we see it throughout the scripture that opinion is divided. We can never get everybody to agree. But those who have the Holy Spirit, those who have the mind of God and those who are praying, uh, and we are not praying, God, please go and do something different. Would you, God, please, would you wake up, God? Why are you asleep? There are prayers like that in the Bible. They are recorded. The scripture does not whitewash the saints. It records them as they are so we can learn from their mistakes and get better. But rather, we should be praying, God, change our heart, as you were reminding us. Transform us. Make us... Um, in." mold us into your image because if if we are not stepping up and if we are not um, witnesses in this generation the God of this world is going to um, keep running wild <laughs> and the God of this world that is the enemy Satan um, is going to um, have his way but we as a church the people of god greater is he who is in us in you than he who is in the world and if we are going to recede and stay back at such a time as this there will be consequences and there is a greater fear that on the day of judgment when we stand before our lord and savior jesus christ he is going to ask us what have you done with the life I have entrusted you. Were you more afraid of physical death or the spiritual death that comes from not uh, my word? And there will be a judgment, there will be a day of reckoning. We will have to give account. So there is a greater fear. Do not fear those who can kill your body, Jesus said, but fear him who can destroy your soul and body in hell. People are going to hell for the lack of knowledge, for not paying attention to his word. And shutting down the economy where the flu takes a lot um, every year, um, a lot of worse things have happened. Um, and worse things are, are coming. And if we can't keep up, as Jeremiah said, um, God speaking to Jeremiah with footmen, how are we going to keep up with horses when they're going to be much faster? Um, so this is a time for us to get ready and get prepared and not um, let those terrorists dictate uh, who are financial agendas, etc. So I want to fear, I'm taking away from this that I don't want to fear death, but faithlessness. And faithlessness um, is not paying attention to the word of the Lord. I want to encourage those of you who want to get to know Moses, for example, and among many other saints, um, at the age of 120, as he's summarizing his life's journey, um, chapter 1 in Deuteronomy will kind of um, give us a great summary of the generation that we find ourselves in, and Moses and God through Moses is trying to reason with us, um, get us back on track. So what's a word of prayer or exhortation you would like to leave us with, Berg? Uh, maybe exhortation. Um, the Bible says, you know, a lot of people I hear so many individuals saying, last days, these are the end times, this is proof of it. Well, let me just point out that Messiah taught that when the last days begin, there's going to be wars, in the plural there's going to be famines earthquakes and not a pestilence but in the plural and if we allow one pestilence to shut us down you know what there's going there's going to be another one and another one and then there's going to be wars there's going to be earthquakes there's, there's going to get so much more so we might as well just close up sell the property just you know stop because Things are not going to necessarily, if we're in the last days, 
If we're in the last days, it's going to get much, much, much worse. There's going to be pestilence. The word is lemoi in the Greek, and it's in the plural. So don't just think one pestilence proves that we're there. There's a series of things that have to happen. So get ready. If the people who say we're, we're approaching the last days, and, and I'm not that disagreeable with that. I think we are. It's, it's converging on that. If that's the case, get ready. We better not stop meeting. We better start adding services, adding prayer groups, adding Bible studies. If we're going to be people who are going to be the salt of the earth, the light of the world, and be people who have a testimony that's honoring our, our Savior. Amen. And so I want to encourage those of you who've been patiently on with us to go to Jorgen O. Baruch, uh, loveisrael.org, uh, many faithful teachings where he is teaching through the Word of God, uh, through the Bible, because that is the most important thing. If, if our pastors and leaders are not doing their job, please um, listen to the Word of the Lord um, as Baruch teaches us in Scripture. Um, read the Word of God. We have the discoverybible.com uh, as well. Um, we've prepared a page for those of you who want to be fed and um, do heart checks. There's something called uh, Helps for the Heart because the most important thing is to guard our heart above all else. For from that, uh, the springs of life flow. Uh, Proverbs 4 verse 23. So those of us who want to keep our heart right, um, because love the Lord your God with all your heart. It starts all there. And for us, heart checks and heart health, um, the discoverybible.com forward slash HC. Um, and we're going to, we'll be happy to email it. And loveisrael.org. Um, please, brothers and sisters, Keep speaking the truth to one another in love. Those who, of you who are wanting to meet, uh, find creative ways of doing that. Um, I'm reminded of the church in China. When they are restricted by the government, who are not acting on behalf of God, as you said, Baruch, but rather for themselves and exploiting the people for financial gain, what is the church doing? They're risking their lives. They are meeting underground. They're meeting in homes. The early church in the book of Acts met in homes. They, and we have, um, on the link that I shared earlier, we're giving tips and uh, helps, uh, like Baruch is as well. Um, and please write us. Um, get in touch if you need help with anything. We're here for you. Uh, this ministry is for you, and thank you, Baruch, for your time uh, staying up late into the night to encourage us. Thank you, Simo, for getting up. I'm sorry that Gary Hill wasn't able to join us, but uh, maybe next time. This is twice in a row that he, he didn't show up. So, Yes, but, uh, Gary sends us his greetings. In fact, he went to a church uh, recently where um, he, had, um, he went into a, a meeting of 10, they had been hit by the coronavirus, by the way, but the leadership decided that it was more important um, to meet than to die uh, spiritually. They would rather, if there is any small chance of death physically, that's minute compared to the eternal death that awaits for those who do not pay attention to the greater uh, call to life. And um, so, Baruch, um, really thank you. Thank you so for much. Uh, exhorting us. I pray that um, you'll continue to uh, preach the word as you are and get even bolder because we need courage. We need a voice in the wilderness. And if it costs us our lives, so be it because there is a resurrection. Amen. Why are we so afraid of death when death is our victory? Death, where is your sting? So why are we acting like there is no resurrection when there is a resurrection? And 
this is our victory. For most people, um, God, we can understand why they're so afraid. <laughs> but it says in First Corinthians 15, a beautiful chapter, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your uh, victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. There is a greater virus, friends, than the coronavirus, and that is called sin. And our Lord Jesus Christ came to save us from the greatest viruses of, of all, by the blood of Jesus. And it says, the power of sin is the law. Any kind of law that we make a law of trying to be righteous in our own sight, in our own eyes, the government, the government is not going to save us. Only Jesus Christ and his word. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. So Amen. thank you, everyone. Um, we'll be in touch. Bless you. And bless thanks you. so much. Shalom. Shalom.